Hey there, I'm Glenn Weldon, and this is NPR's Book of the Day. Today we're bringing you two recent books about world-changing moments in the history of music. In a minute, we'll hear from a married couple whose latest kid's picture book tells the fascinating and very twisty story of the creation of the saxophone. But first up, William Robin and Carrie O'Brien are a pair of musicologists who've written On Minimalism, Documenting a Musical Movement. It traces the history of this mysterious and often misunderstood musical approach, paying particular attention to the international music that influenced it and to the many other figures, besides its most well-known adherents like Philip Glass, whose vital contributions haven't yet seen their share of the spotlight. NPR's Noah Caldwell spoke with the authors for All Things Considered. The Up First podcast gives you three of the biggest news stories to start your day. It's short but thorough. In 15 minutes or less, Up First delivers all the news you need to feel informed without feeling overwhelmed so you can get back to doing whatever it is you need to do. Listen now to the Up First podcast from NPR. This message comes from NPR sponsor, Osea. Give your body the care it deserves with Osea's best-selling Undaria Algae Body Oil. Get 10% off your first order at oseamalibu.com with code GLOW, plus free shipping on orders over $60. On November 4, 1964, an ensemble of musicians took the stage at the San Francisco Tape Music Center. The first thing you hear is this constant reiterating eighth notes played on the piano sees this pulse. William Robin is a musicologist at the University of Maryland. That night was the debut of an experimental composition. It was written by a young composer named Terry Riley, but it was the musicians who were in control of the performance. They could each choose from 53 musical phrases, all of them revolving around the note C, to play for as long or as short as they wanted, before moving on to the next one. It was called In C. It was unusually reviewed by the San Francisco Chronicle. A music critic went and saw it and said, like, this is music like none other on earth. Around the same time, similar experiments in avant-garde music were being performed in lofts in New York City. A new genre of music was emerging. Some people called it hypnotic. People who didn't like it called it needle-stuck-in-the-groove music. A lot of people called it trance music. Carrie O'Brien is another musicologist. She teaches at the Cornish College of the Arts in Seattle. Once the music eventually was described as minimalist, the composers weren't a fan because it can have connotations of simplicity. So they rejected the title, but, you know, it stuck. Minimalism. By the end of the 60s, minimalism had not only solidified, it had produced a quartet of founding fathers credited with bringing the genre to life. Terry Riley, Steve Reich, Lamont Young, and Philip Glass. But there are limitations to a story that relies on the founding fathers. There were so many other folks creating minimalist music in this period, and that includes women and people of color and LGBTQ plus musicians. So O'Brien and Robin set out to write the lesser known story of minimalism. Their book, called On Minimalism, is out now. It begins with the artistic and cultural influences that set the stage for the early minimalists, including music that came from the other side of the world. They were very profoundly influenced by the first recordings of Indian music that were reaching the West at this time in the late 50s and early 60s. A number of things changed in the 1960s. The lifting of the Asian Immigration Act changed the ability of musicians from India to come to the U.S., So all of a sudden, musicians were able to study firsthand with gurus. You have these musicians who are sustaining a single note for hours on ends and trying to hear all of the complexity that comes out of just sustaining a single drone. There's also an important part of early minimalism is through modal jazz. There's a a case to be made that Miles Davis was one of our first minimalists. You could also call John Coltrane one of our first minimalists. In pieces or albums like Africa Brass, tracks like India, he, like Rish and Riley, were significantly influenced by North Indian music, West African music, and incorporated those influences into their music, which resulted in an attraction to drones, an attraction to repetition. 
One of the reasons this music has endured is because it has this continued engagement with pop music and especially with rock music. So in the early 70s, The Who pay overt homage to minimalism in the opening of their song, Baba O'Reilly, which is named for Terry Riley. A few years later, you have Brian Eno and David Bowie collaborating on a series of albums that are very much influenced by the fact that they're listening to a ton of Steve Reich and Philip Glass in this period. There's also figures like the composer Pauline Oliveros. She was really drawn to drones that she found in the environment, like the droning of highway noise or like buzzing electricity. She once spent an entire year dedicated to droning on a single note, an A, on her accordion and using her voice. And she went so far as to say that, like, music wasn't necessarily the whole point. Music was a byproduct of her practice that was really a tuning of the mind and body. So another important figure in this period is Julius Eastman, whose work is undergoing this really important revival after it was largely neglected in the years around his early and untimely death. He was part of this next generation of composers who were engaging with minimalism in the 70s and 80s, who were thinking less about the kind of abstraction of the music, and instead engaging with it as a part of his identity, in this case, as a queer black man. One Piece Gay Gorilla, he he explains in a pre-concert talk that he intended it the, the way that you talk about Afghani gorillas or PLO gorillas, people who are in a fight. And he said, you know, if he was called upon to be one, he would want to be a gay gorilla. You know, this is 10 years after Stonewall, on the kind of the cusp of the AIDS epidemic. So this piece, Gay Gorilla, it's minimalist in multiple ways. For one thing, it begins with just single notes on the piano, and it builds and builds over about 20 or 30 minutes. And through repetition and through accumulation, it offers this kind of spiritual and a kind of musical fortress. This music has this way of coming back again and again. And you look forward into the 1990s and there are British techno musicians who are playing and sampling Steve Reich at raves and in pop singles. And this continues into the 21st century where you have indie rock acts like Bon Iver and The National and Sufjan Stevens who are very strongly influenced by minimalism. You have composers in the classical world, someone like Nico Muley or Missy Mazzoli, who are bringing you know, the pulses that were developed in the 60s into orchestral music. But you also have a drone or doom metal band like Sun that is playing this like ecstatically dark drone music. <laughs> So both the techniques and I think also the kind of loftier metaphysical ideas are ones that are continually appealing to musicians in many different genres. You know, music aside, composer names aside, there's a number of kind of lessons within minimalism, ways that minimalism really can change a listener, the ways that minimalism kind of cultivates your attention. There's a lot of different things that are kind of vying for our attention and the ability to, like, stay with something, stay with a drone, stay with a pattern, stay with yourself, I think is just, like, such a valuable thing that minimalist music can teach you. That was Carrie O'Brien and William Robin, musicologists and authors of the new book on minimalism. The Up First podcast gives you three of the biggest news stories to start your day. It's short but thorough. In 15 minutes or less, Up First delivers all the news you need to feel informed without feeling overwhelmed so you can get back to doing whatever it is you need to do. Listen now to the Up First podcast from NPR. Lisa Klein Ransom and James Ransom make kids' picture books together. She writes them. He illustrates them. Their latest, The Story of the Saxophone, is just that, but it's also the story of its Belgian inventor, Antoine Joseph Sax. His friends knew him as Adolf. Sax's life was 
eventful. I'll let them tell you more about that. But the book also chronicles what happens once his invention makes its way to the States and into the hands and the lips of musicians who'd use it to produce a sound so distinctive that it would come to define jazz. NPR Samantha Balaban talked to the writer and illustrator duo about their book and their marriage and their creative process for Weekend Edition Sunday. My name's James Ransom. I have illustrated 72 books. My name is Lisa Klein Ransom, and I am an author of about 25 picture books. I've known Lisa since she was 19 years old. We met at Pratt Institute at a Purple Rain party. I asked her to dance, and um, we've been dancing together ever since. We knew we were a match because he would help me with all of my art projects, and I would help him with all of his writing assignments, and that's kind of how we knew we would be together forever. And indeed, Lisa Klein Ransom and James Ransom have now been married for 33 years. They've had four children, now grown, and they've produced multiple picture books together, including Before She Was Harriet, Overground Railroad, and Satchel Page. The 2001 PBS documentary Jazz, which they watched together, helped inspire their latest children's book. For our series of conversations between authors and illustrators, picture this, we spoke with Lisa Klein Ransom and James Ransom about the story of the saxophone. I grew up with my grandmother, but she was not playing jazz. Jazz was always this music that was around me, um, but it was always this sort of um, very sophisticated music that people usually had um, you know, great taste, it was adult. And I didn't feel comfortable. I did not know the history, did not know all these things about it. But watching and listening to the Ken Burns documentary helped catch me up. Now jazz is played in my studio all the time when I'm working. James and I have become somewhat jazz fans. I grew up in a very much a jazz household with parents who were Depression era, huge jazz fans. And we're regular attendees at the Newport Jazz Festival. (laughs) It's like our favorite place to go. So um, I often get ideas for books, and from jazz history, I know that Coleman Hawkins and Lester Young were major um, contributors to the reason why the saxophone has developed in the jazz world in bands. So I I said, Lisa, it would be great to do a book about Coleman Hawkins and, and Lester Young, a sort of a comparison about their sounds. So I started in on my research, as I always do, listening to music, doing some more reading. You know, when I'm working in a book, I really need to be connected to the subject that I'm writing about. I found that I couldn't make the connection that I normally make. One day, I just asked myself, like, this really simple question, who invented the saxophone? And I found an incredible story of Joseph Antoine Adolf Sax, a young man who lived in Dinant. Belgium in the 1800s, who was the son of an instrument maker. He was a child who was really always having difficult times. He was always had a lot of bad luck in his life. I mean, by the time he was 10 years old, he had basically fallen down a flight of stairs and swallowed a needle. He'd been poisoned. He'd almost drowned. He'd been burned by gunpowder. He was even in a coma for a period of time. But he was also an incredible inventor, and he was lucky to be in a workshop alongside his father where his father let him experiment and tinker and and tweak. And so he wound up inventing several different instruments, which included the steam organ and the sax tuba and the euphonium, the bass tuba, and the flugelhorn. But he was looking for a very specific sound when he happened upon creating the saxophone. His goal was to have this instrument highlighted as a feature instrument in military bands, which is a popular way to showcase instruments at the time. That's how it gained popularity. The real collaboration comes in the beginning when we're talking about the project. And then I go off and I start my research and my writing Yeah, so I basically leave Lisa alone to write. I sort of pitch an idea, and then she goes and knocks a home run. Throughout that process, I will come in and share different various drafts with James. Sometimes it's a year or so before I get to the book. 
because remember, she can write much faster than I can illustrate. I'm always, where is this? Where's the book? How long does it take? I get the manuscript, I look it over, and I just start almost like working with a writer that I don't know. Lisa does not come in and comment on the pictures or say anything about them. She doesn't read it along and look at the pictures or anything. A year later, we'll get proofs, and then probably a few months after that, we get bound books. So that's the process. It's quite a long process. I love what he surprises me with when I walk into the studio and I discover, oh, and this is what he's doing. Oh, and it's this page. And you look and each page, as you turn the page, you're just drawn into this world. You're in Belgium. You're in Paris. You know, you're in Mexico. You're in New Orleans. And he creates worlds for young readers that I think are just magical. I try to make it a little uh, on, the, on the humor side, making people shorter or wider. So there's exaggerations in the, in the body parts. But maybe I should step back and say, imagine black and white drawings with touches of watercolor and touches of collage. All the saxophones that you see in the interiors, I didn't paint, those are all collage pieces. So I just took pictures of saxophones, and I cut them up, almost like a Picasso type saxophone. I wanted it to be the sort of dominant thing on the page that we sort of followed, like a bouncing ball going through the book. What I love about what James did with the saxophone, which is, you know, why he's one of my favorite illustrators, it replicates the idea of this boy who pieced together this brand new instrument. And so it really does illustrate that. I never thought about that. Oh, really? Yeah, I never thought about that. <laughs> It's very shocking for people that the saxophone is, a, is an instrument that we really do associate with jazz. And here is this man in Belgium who really wanted an instrument that would sound great in regimental bands, which to me is kind of the opposite of jazz. <laughs> and jazz musicians, you know, often black jazz musicians, took this instrument, made it their own, and transformed music. This is one where I suggested something, and what she brings back is always much, much better than I could ever imagine. You know, her storytelling is interesting, how she connects things, how she sort of finds um, a viewpoint um, about him being curious, and how he always sort of got himself into trouble because he was curious. I think it's just phenomenal writing. I mean, that's what it's all about. And I think that's what makes it so fun, you know, reading the book and sharing the book, with, uh, especially with young readers, even with adults, for them to discover that this instrument was invented so long ago by this very young man. I don't know if he was even 20 years old when he invented the saxophone. And he invented it simply because he was curious. I think that sometimes the ways in which we live and grow in this world, especially with children... Curiosity sometimes is the first thing that leaves us. I think that sometimes people, kids in particular, aren't encouraged to ask and, and explore enough. And it was only through Joseph Antoine Sachs's curiosity that he made these discoveries. So I hope that they remember to remain curious about exploring and looking at the world. That was Lisa Klein Ransom and James Ransom talking about their children's book, The Story of the Saxophone. Our series, Picture This, is produced by Samantha Balaban. That's it for this week on NPR's Book of the Day. If you want more, you can sign up for our newsletter at npr.org slash newsletter slash books. I'm Glenn Weldon. The podcast is produced by Isabella Gomez Sarmiento and edited by Taylor Burney. Our founding editor is Petra Mayer. The show elements for this week were produced and edited by Andrew Craig, Matthew Sherman, Fernando Naro Roman, Shannon Rhodes, Lee Hale, Katie Klein, Rena Advani, Noah Caldwell, Bridget Kelly, Samantha Balaban, and Melissa Gray. Beth Donovan is our managing editor. Thanks for listening.
Numbers that explain the economy. We love them at The Indicator from Planet Money. And on Fridays, we discuss indicators in the news, like job numbers, spending, the cost of food, sometimes all three. So my indicator is about why you might need to bring home more bacon to afford your eggs. I'll be here all week. Wrap up your week and listen to The Indicator podcast from NPR.